All right, I guess, shall we start? Great. It's my greatest pleasure to introduce Dr. Bing Ren as our first esteemed speaker of the Genetics Departmental Seminar Series this year. Dr. Ren currently serves as a professor in the Department of Cellular and Molecular Medicine and as the director of the Center of Epigenomics at UCSD. He received a bachelor's degree in biophysics from the University of Science and Technology of China, a master's degree in computer science from Harvard University, and his PhD in biochemistry from Harvard as well. He then did his postdoctoral research at the Whitehead Institute in Dr. Richard Young's lab and joined UCSD as a faculty member afterwards. Dr. Ren has made a series of epic and highly influential discoveries in the fields of uh, gene regulation, epigenomics, and 3D genomics. Since his talk today, obviously, uh, is about um, uh, the gene regulatory sequence and epigenomics, I'll just give one example of his many groundbreaking discoveries in a parallel field uh, that is Shredi genomics. So Dr. Ren actually discovered topologically associating domains, or TADs, which I think, and many agree, is the biggest discovery in the field of Shredi genomics in the past 10 years. It really opened up and broadened our field with so many labs around the globe following his discoveries and adapting his pipeline to study um, TAD biology in different biological contexts and also in diseases, inspired by the rich structural and also mechanistic and functional insights that he offered from that very initial report. It's such a seminal discovery that over the years, up to this point, if you go to the Sri Lanka Genomic Conference, you'll constantly find that the majority of the talks talking about TADs, my, my talk included. So I really wonder um, what it feels like from the discoverer's perspective, you know, like you discover something and you go to conferences, the major theme for years. Um, so uh, we really get constantly inspired um, by his masterpieces. Dr. Ren's phenomenal contributions to multiple fields through his career has been recognized by many prestigious awards, including the Helen Hay Whitney Fellowship, the Kidney Kimmel Scholar Award, the Charlotte Greer Foundation Award, the Distinguished Young Investigator Award of Chinese Biological Investigators Society, the Chen Award for Distinguished Academic Achievement in Human Genetic and Genomic Research, and the Association of Chinese Geneticists in America Excellence in Genetics Research Award. He's also an elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences. Now, without further ado, I give the floor to my personal hero, Dr. Bing Yen. Thank you so much, Steve, for that very kind introduction. Uh, can, can everyone hear me? Just want to get a uh, feedback. Yes, yes. Very good, thank you. Uh, and i uh, like to um, uh, say it's a great ple pleasure to uh, give this seminar, uh, although virtually. Uh, I initially agreed to uh, visit in person in, Mar uh, in March, and which unfortunately was canceled due to COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but I'm glad to uh, take this opportunity uh, today to start the fall seminar series, uh, which is held in virtual format. <clears throat> Nearly two decades have passed since the human genome was completely sequenced, but understanding the genome sequence um, has been uh, very challenging. Um, less than 2% of the DNA is uh, coding for genes, while the vast majority is non-coding, but still possess biological functions. So the major goal of genome sciences today is to decode the genome function, especially the non-coding part. Among the non-coding sequences, a class of uh, functional elements collectively known as cis-regulatory elements, they act like switches that turn genes on and off uh, at the specific cell types and de uh, developmental time. Changes in such sequences are increasingly found to be uh, underlying the causes of human disease, such as cancer. So some of the major unanswered questions in the field has been what sequences serve as cis regulatory elements? When and where do these elements function? How do they control the spatial temporal expression of specific genes? Answer to such questions obviously would help us understand 
gene regulatory programs encoding, encoded in the genome sequence and, and decipher the function of many non-coding risk variants. I want to briefly introduce you the three classes of cis regulatory elements um, that we know today. The first one, which was also understood the best, is promoters. These are the sequences that serve to dock the RNA polymerase and the associate factors to initiate transcription. The second class of elements um, that are increasingly uh, studied uh, are known as enhancers. Enhancers serve to modulate the activities of promoters in a tissue and developmental time specific manner. They serve to recruit sequence specific transcription factors, and there are thousands of them in the genome, whose function is to recruit chromatin remodelers that alter the local chromatin structure, bringing enhancers and promoters together in 3D space and initiate transcription of the promoters uh, in the right time at the right cell type. Note that in this process, several histone modifications has been recognized to play important roles. This namely lysine 4 methylation, which is catalyzed by chromatin modelers. They are uh, initial um, sign that the enhancer become primed to be activated. And lysine 27 acylation is a mark that indicate that it, that enhancer is highly active. And these histone marks serve as in, uh, um, actually very nice detectors for enhancers in the genome. Sequence changes in enhancers has been uh, shown to cause uh, many human traits. One is shown here, a single base changes in an enhancer of the sonic hedgehog gene is responsible for this uh, polydectomy phenotype uh, with uh, the individual carrying the mutation have the extra thumb. And, and the sequence uh, of this enhancer is sufficient to drive a heterologous reporter gene in the, uh, in the limb at the early embryos. This uh, indicate how enhancers uh, play uh, such a specific role in gene regulation. And they are now recognized as the key element responsible for spatial temporal patterns of gene expression. A third class of elements that are also very interesting and is related to the 3D genome topology is known as insulators. Discovered almost 20 years ago uh, by um, Jerry, uh, Gary Falsenfeld, uh, these elements were shown to act in an orientation dependent manner. When they're inserted in between the enhancer and the promoter, they serve to block the enhancer from activating the promoter. But if they are inserted outside of that enhancer, they uh, do not influence the function of enhancers. So these are coined uh, the term insulator. And over the years, uh, Dr. Falsenfeld and many others have uh, illustrated that the key protein responsible for mammalian insulators is uh, CDCF. This is a uh, DNA binding protein that carry 11 zinc finger DNA binding domains and the sequence is uh, long and uh, uh, are uh, widespread in the genome. So there are many major barriers today still that um, preventing us from have a complete knowledge of the cis regulatory element in the genome. First, the maps of the cis elements in the genome acting in most tissues and cell types are still lacking. And secondly, the genes influenced by such regulatory element have not been precisely defined. Uh, for the majority of the elements that we have known. And finally, uh, transcription factors that act on different cis regulatory elements remain to be characterized. Uh, to solve such problems, let's bring in the concept of epigenome. Epigenome is uh, a term that refers to the covalent modifications to DNA to histone proteins, 
and also the structure of the chromatin. DNA methylation, uh, mainly occurring on the uh, CPG dinucleotide, is known to affect transcription factor binding to the DNA and is um, associated with transcriptional silencing of uh, retrotransposable element and the heterochromatin regions. Modifications to the histones, um, there are, there are a variety of them, uh, such as acylation, methylation, sumulation, uh, ubiquination, phosphorylation, and so on. And by, uh, by now, hundreds of uh, distinct uh, histone modifications has been discovered, and only a small fraction of them uh, functionally characterized. Of those that are uh, extensively characterized um, histone modifications, uh, they uh, are known to play both active or repressive roles uh, in uh, gene regulation. And they served as uh, binding sites for chromatin regulators uh, that carry out either repressive function or active function. And they change the chromatin structure, uh, exposing sequences for transcription factor binding, and so on. And as uh, Steve just mentioned, uh, 3D chromatin structure plays an instrumental role in gene regulation by either exposing the DNA that are associated with transcription factors and gene regulatory elements, or uh, allowing distal elements to make contact with their targets. So clearly, uh, a detailed analysis of the uh, cell's epigenome uh, is going to help us understand the gene regulatory mechanisms in diverse cell types. Uh, and it's also very important to know, if I haven't made it clear, is that unlike the genome, that, which is uh, identical in virtually all cell types in the body, epigenome differ from cell types to cell types, and it is highly dynamic. And that therefore, um, epigenome is one that holds the key to understand the genome output. How do we study epigenome? The, uh, a variety of cell, uh, method has been developed over the years. Uh, ChIP-seq, for example, was invented to uh, characterize the uh, histone modifications genome-wide. DNA-seq um, uh, was invented to characterize the open chromatin, um, and the uh, um, mnase-seq is used to identify uh, patterns of chromatin uh, his nucleosomes in the genome. This variety of approaches have uh, been used to characterize the dynamic epigenome in, um, in mouse embryos um, as part of the ENCODE uh, project. Uh, and the study was recently published in Nature as a collection of uh, ENCODE papers. And here I just want to show you that uh, my lab in collaboration with uh, Lam Panacio, uh, Joe Ecker, uh, Axel Visso, Barbara Wald, uh, Jiang uh, Stamata, Jana Paulus, uh, applied uh, a variety of techniques, such as ATAC-seq, DNA-seq, CHIP-seq, whole genome by sulfide sequencing, and RNA-seq uh, to a set of uh, embryonic tissues over eight stages of embryonic development to create a dynamic maps of epigenome for uh, multiple tissues. Uh, and the multiple developmental stages. And this such maps allowed us to uh, paint a dynamic epigenome and the functional sequences for the, mouse, uh, for the mouse genome. For example, let me show you NeuroD2, a, a neuronal uh, genes expressed in 13 or 14.5 day embryonic development. When it's on, it has, um, its gene is marked by multiple different histone marks in its neighborhood uh, and uh, showing accessibilities that tell us this is the promoter, this is the enhancer of this gene. And um, across tissues, you can see that the histone modification, especially lysine 27 isolation, show uh, extreme tissue uh, specificity, uh, only marking this locus in the forebrain and henbrain uh, and neurotube and uh, anything, uh, any tissue else. 
And during development, you can tell based on the marking of lysine 27 isolation that this gene uh, promoter become turned on uh, around 13.5 day and uh, reaching its peak around 15.5 day. Um, and that correlate with RNA polymerase uh, expression uh, in the genome. Sorry, this is a gene expression in the green and this down here is uh, K27 isolation showing both um, dynamic histone marks at the promoter and the distal elements uh, surrounding this gene. So this is how we can now begin to read uh, the regulatory sequences and their activities in different cell types and in different uh, developmental stage. To confirm that uh, the histone modification marking is telling us function, uh, my collaborator Len Panesio and Axel Vissel's lab uh, performed mouse transgenic assays. Uh, for example, they take elements that are marked by peak of lysine 27 acylation, uh, inserting such element into a reporter plasmid uh, driving lac -Z expression. Uh, inject them into the fertilized mouse egg and uh, uh, re-implant, collect the embryos at 11.5 day, stain the embryo with lac -Z to see where uh, the element is um, uh, active. And you can basically show, uh, we can show that when an element is marked by strong lysine 27 acylation, uh, the vast majority of them uh, can drive tissue specific expression of reporter genes, confirming that they are uh, marking the active enhancers. But if the element is marked only by medius, uh, modest or low levels of uh, lysine 27, the validation becomes, uh, uh, rate become much less. So this uh, kind of evidence give us confirmation that uh, the lysine 27 oscillation and many other histone marks uh, allow us to uh, pinpoint active enhancers in specific cell types and tissues. There is limitation though with the current approach and the limitation is uh, obvious in the slides. Uh, we know it's uh, that different tissues are uh, made of uh, heterogeneous cell types. Uh, for example, one um, uh, heart uh, is shown here, consists of um, uh, not only cardiomyocyte, but also fibroblasts and other cell types. So when uh, you see an enhancer uh, marked by uh, hyper uh, DNA uh, accessibility, um, you wonder which cell type this enhancer is active in. And this is particularly relevant because in this heart enhancer shown before to be associated uh, uh, to, to harbor a, a risk variance associated with a, a, a QRS duration trait, uh, knowing which cell type this uh, enhancer is active will help us interpret the function of this um, uh, risk variance, non-coding variance. So to uh, solve this problem, uh, the issue, uh, uh, the, the strategy that we and others have uh, taken is single cell epigenomics. Um, so this slide uh, was uh, a summary from Wolf Reich's review, uh, highlighting uh, several years ago already uh, a rapidly evolving field of single cell uh, genomics. Uh, the uh, approach multiple uh, method has been developed to uh, interrogate uh, histone modification, chromatin accessibility, and transcription DNA methylation in the cells one at a time. They generally can be separated into two uh, groups. Uh, one is called droplet barcoding. In this case, uh, most notably uh, offered by uh, 10x genomics, uh, you incubate uh, a beads uh, that are coded with a specific DNA barcode with the cell. Uh, and uh, so that now you can release the barcodes from the beads uh, in a droplet uh, and essentially barcode that particular uh, the material from that cell. A separate approach uh, that achieve a similarly uh, cell-specific barcoding is called combinatorial barcoding. In this case, uh, you, you, you can put a pool of cells in a, uh, a multi-well uh, plate 
uh, and perform uh, multiple runs of barcoding by uh, polling and splitting. You can do this multiple runs. After a sufficient number of runs, you can achieve uh, millions of combinations of DNA barcodes, and that allow us to, um, again, uh, achieve cell-specific uh, barcoding and the molecular assays. We now apply this approach to uh, multiple human tissues. I want to give you one example uh, of how we apl apply this approach to, um, uh, to uh, understand uh, the non-coding risk variants underlying human trait. In this case, uh, we focused on uh, cardio, um, uh, cardiac cell types uh, in the heart. Uh, we collaborated with uh, Neil Chi from UCSD, a, um, a physician scientist focused on uh, cardiac uh, biology. Uh, my student, uh, Jake Hawker, in collaboration with uh, uh, Dr. Sebastian Prezo, a former postdoc who is now uh, associate director of the Center for Epigenomics that I had, uh, 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 performed uh, single cell attack seek, which is a combinatorial barcoding strategy on uh, four human hearts, each heart uh, we use, um, uh, we, we dissect four different heart chambers and study each one of them with single cell ataxic approach. Uh, we obtained a total of uh, uh, 79,000 um, nuclear profiles and uh, using single cell ataxic um, uh, snap attack, uh, in software that my lab invented a few years ago, we identified a total of nine uh, cell clusters. These were annotated based on the Crompton accessibility profiles of uh, marker genes. For example, um, uh, cardiomyocyte markers such as NPPA and the mouse gene heavy gene uh, seven uh, were used to classify these two uh, cardiomyocyte uh, 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 and ventricular or atrial cardiomyocyte cell types. Uh, and um, the uh, DCN was used to um, characterize the uh, fibroblast cell types. And so, um, and the EGFL7 is used to uh, annotate the endothelial cells and so on and so forth. To discover uh, regulatory element in each cell types uh, of the human heart, we aggregate uh, the single cell attack seek profiles uh, from each clusters and perform peak calling. We identify a total of 270,000 candidates as regulatory element uh, in uh, all cell types in the heart. And this type of map allow us now to dissect uh, the uh, cell types where risk variant might be active. For example, in this risk variant associated with the QRS durations, now we can clearly see that uh, the enhancers identified from the bulk uh, DNA hypersensitive site is actually attributable to both the ventricular or, uh, or atrial cardiomyocytes. Uh, and uh, there's uh, strong evidence that these two cell types, uh, or, and one of them, might uh, be associated with the function of this risk of variance. Non-coding variants uh, contributing to the risk of complex traits and disease are known to be enriched within the uh, regulatory sequences in a cell type specific fashion. To examine the enrichment of, of cardiovascular disease variants within the elements that we discovered, in the uh, nine specific cardio outside, uh, cardiac cell types, we performed cell types stratified linkage disequilibrium score regression analysis. Um, so to look for enrichment of uh, such trait. Uh, and as is shown in this uh, heat map, uh, atrial fibrillation trait uh, associated uh, sequence variants is strongly enriched in the candidate this regulatory element discovered in the atrial and ventricular uh, cardiomyocyte, uh, while uh, varicose wing associated uh, sequence variants is enriched in endothelial uh, regulatory elements. 
So we focus on the atrial fibrillation uh, from uh, 6,000 fine mapped variants at 111 loci associated with this trait. Uh, we uh, narrow down to 216 variants with a posterior probability of association uh, or likelihood of uh, being causal variants uh, above 0.1. Uh, and 38 of them we found to be overlap with cardiomyocyte associated uh, uh, candidate cis regulatory elements, including two shown here, uh, which both exhibiting a strong likelihood of being causal to atrial fibrillation. And, um, and they are located in a candidate regulatory elements in the intronic region of uh, a potassium channel gene called KCH8, KCNH2. Um, and uh, this cis regulatory element is showing correlated accessibility with the promoters of, uh, of this gene. To test whether these elements harboring these two risk variants are indeed responsible for, uh, for traits, uh, we perform a serious experiment using a uh, in vitro uh, human ESL differentiation system that uh, has been established in Neo Chi's lab. In this system, uh, we uh, differentiate the um, uh, embryonic stem cells into, um, into cardiomyocyte over a 15-day time course. And in this time, we also performed a TAC-seq, RNA-seq, and lysine 27 acylation chip-seq. And we showed that this element is increasing in its um, accessibility and the histone modification over time of differentiation. And then when we perform reporter-based assays using luciferase uh, reporter, we can demonstrate that uh, this element, uh, when it has a homozygous uh, risk alleles, it has much reduced activity compared to um, homozygous uh, reference alleles, uh, suggesting that this element indeed uh, potentially carry enhancer function as in, and impacted by the sequence variants. We further deleted this element uh, by a CRISPR uh, knockout uh, approach. Uh, and in this, uh, in this analysis, we show that um, uh, the uh, deletion of this element in the human embryonic stem cells result in decreased the uh, KCNH2 expression in an enhanced dosage specific manner. In heterozygous deletion, you see uh, mild reduction of uh, KCNH, KCNH2 expression. In homozygous deletion, you see a, uh, uh, a significant reduction, more than 50% of the expression level was reduced. So uh, we infer that uh, from this analysis that the uh, candidate elements discovered uh, through our um, single cell taxic that harbor the risk variants is required for optimal uh, potassium channel expression in the uh, cardiomyocyte. Finally, what does this mean in terms of physiological trait? Um, uh, similar to human cardiomyocyte with loss of um, uh, KCH2 function due to mutations in the KCH2 coding sequences or gene knockdown, the physiological studies here demonstrate that um, cardiomyocyte, uh, this, um, the deletion of, the, uh, of this enhancer uh, is uh, causing a, a prolonged um, action potential duration as shown in this, uh, uh, in this graph. Uh, this indicate that um, the, uh, this enhancer uh, that we discovered since uh, using this uh, cis uh, single cell taxi um, is uh, responsible for um, is uh, for a normal repolarization uh, in the atrial cardiomyocyte, uh, and this defect uh, upon the uh, caused by the risk variant may underlie a mechanism for atrial fibrillation. Um, so, um, to summarize what I've just shown you, I highlighted one approach that uh, through single cell chromatin accessibility assays uh, can enable the annotation of candidate cis-regulatory element active in different cell types 
in the body. Uh, so this approach uh, can be applied generally to all kind of tissues and cell types and uh, cross cell uh, uh, different developmental stage. And I think we'll hold the, uh, we'll, uh, hope the promise for us to have a complete understanding of uh, cell type specific regulatory elements in the genome. The next step and next hurdles that we face is understanding the function of this candidate regulatory elements. And among uh, uh, such, uh, one of the key hurdles is to uh, find out what genes such elements may control. Uh, today, I would like to share, uh, there are multiple approaches to this, and I'd like to share with you um, two that uh, my lab have been um, particularly uh, invested uh, and uh, these one of them is based upon analyzing the co um, correlation between uh, distal element chromosome state and the gene expression levels in uh, in a set uh, in a uh, in a single cell specific uh, resolution uh, so here a couple of years ago uh, we published a method called paired seq uh, this uh, allowed us to jointly analyze the chromatin accessibility and uh, nuclear transcriptome uh, in a single cell in a, in a massively parallel fashion. Uh, here is how it works. Uh, we would uh, start with um, uh, TN5 tagmentation of the uh, open chromatin, adding a DNA barcode to uh, open chromatin in a cell type specific manner, uh, sorry, in, in a well, uh, uh, in different wells. Uh, in each well, we also perform reverse transcription using uh, DNA barcodes for that specific well. So in, after this initial steps of uh, molecular reaction, uh, including both tagmentation and reverse transcription, we then perform um, a ligation mediated DNA barcoding. So in this process, multiple rounds of pool and splitting uh, was performed. Uh, in each run, uh, the DNA, uh, unique DNA barcode was added in each different well. Uh, after that ligation, the cells of all the wells are then pulled together and re-dispensed into uh, separate wells. And now uh, the second round of uh, ligation was performed. So you can do this in two or three runs or even four runs. And uh, if you perform this in 96 well plates, you will accumulate millions of different uh, combinations of barcodes. As a final step, we perform uh, amplification and then splitting, separating the DNA, uh, open DNA bar li libraries from the RNA encoding libraries and sequencing them separately in a high throughput sequencer. Uh, since it was published several years ago, I won't go into detail how uh, what, uh, of this method, but uh, we, I just want to say we applied it to um, uh, mouse cortex and also fetal uh, embryonic uh, forebrains uh, and perform uh, uh, parasic. Uh, so here we can see that uh, in the same, we can perform clustering and identify jointly in each cluster, the RNA expression and the histone modification um, in the corresponding cell types. So by having both uh, molecular uh, modalities measured from the same cells, we have the chance to assess how well the promoter and enhancers are correlated in terms of uh, chromosome accessibility and gene expression. And from this, we can then identify those pairs that show substantial correlation between the histone modification and uh, uh, sorry, uh, chromatin accessibility and the target gene expression. Um, and when we do this, we found that the result show very good correlation with uh, 3D genome confirmation measured using a method called PlaxSeq. So what is PlaxSeq? Uh, this is a method my lab de uh, developed a few years ago. Uh, it uh, start with uh, so-called high c uh, that use uh, essentially cross-linking and in situ ligation to um, assess the uh, spatial relationship between uh, uh, DNA fragments inside the cell. Uh, 
Uh, but to reduce the cost, we also perform a, a quantum immunoprecipitation after this first round of uh, proximity ligation uh, to enrich for uh, ligation product centered on specific uh, histone modifications. And that's the name, um, proximity um, assisted, uh, uh, proximity ligation assisted chip. Uh, that's what PlaxSeq is uh, named. So from this analysis, we can then identify long range uh, enhancer promoter interactions. And we show that the gene uh, distal enhancer pairs detected by ParaSeq shown here uh, are uh, well supported by long range uh, spatial contacts detected by PlaxSeq. Besides PAIR-seq, now we have uh, invented a new method, uh, still um, published, uh, called PAIR-tag. Uh, the difference between PAIR-tag and PAIR-seq is that PAIR-tag allow us to jointly analyze the histone marks and the uh, nuclear transcriptome at single cell level. Uh, the main addition of PAIR-tag over PAIR-seq is this step called cut and tag. Uh, this is a method that was invented by Steve Hanikoff's lab that allow you to interrogate transcription factor or histone modification binding in the cell in a highly sensitive and efficient manner. So what, uh, what pair tag and what cut and tag does is you first stain the cells with antibodies that recognize specific DNA binding protein or histone modification. After that, you can then infuse the cells with protein A uh, fused to uh, a TN5 tag uh, enzyme uh, that are in, uh, coupled with DNA barcodes. So, uh, so after this step, uh, you can basically um, perform the rest of the steps similar as we do with PARASEQ, uh, meaning by uh, activating the enzyme with uh, uh, magnesium to introduce uh, double strand breaks and, uh, uh, and the ligation of the DNA barcodes in a well specific manner. Uh, following that, perform reverse transcriptase uh, reaction, again, adding a separate DNA barcode to the cDNA. Uh, following that, then perform uh, ligation and uh, barcoding and uh, sequencing of the DNA and RNA libraries. We apply this method to a mouse frontal cortex and a mouse hippocampus, and that gave us the a bit, um, essentially uh, a total of 45 nuclei, 1,000 nuclei, uh, where uh, we interrogated uh, both the nuclear RNA and the one of the four histone marks, uh, in, namely lysine 4 monomethylation, uh, lysine 4, uh, lysine 27 acylation. Uh, both of which are marking active enhancers. Uh, lysine 27 trimethylation, which is a mark for uh, re polycone repressive uh, DNA, and lysine 9 trimethylation, which is a mark for heterochromatin regions. So we perform a clustering analysis using uh, the RNA component of the pair tag data, and that uh, allow us to identify roughly 22 uh, cell populations, uh, including uh, uh, multiple uh, non-neuronal populations such as uh, astrocyte endothelial cells, uh, oligodendrocyte progenitor cells, microglia and oligodendrocyte, for example, uh, and multiple uh, excitatory neurons as well as inhibitory neurons. Um, and for each cell types, now we can plot both the RNA levels and uh, histone modifications for the corresponding cell type. And uh, what this shows is that uh, the power of this analysis is that when you look at um, multiple histone modifications, you can now read the mechanisms of um, promoter uh, regulation by the distinct uh, epigenetic pathways. For example, roughly 2,000 gene promoters is occupied by the hectochromatin lysine 9 trimethylation mark in, uh, across all the cell types, except for some uh, non-neuronal cell types, suggesting that this set of genes are controlled by 
lysine nitrine methylation, uh, a heterochromatin mark. Uh, and this set of genes are enriched for signaling transduction pathways and sensory perception, including uh, olfactory receptor genes, uh, strongly uh, supporting the role of lysine nitrine methylation in their regulation. Another 1,000 genes uh, are associated with uh, uh, polycone repressor mark lysine 27 at the promoter, um, again, across uh, virtually all neuronal cell types. Uh, and these are enriched for developmental uh, genes involved in neurogenesis. And then the rest of uh, genes, uh, gene promoters, are associated with active gene promoters in a cell type specific manner. Uh, and, this, uh, and that active content marks is also associated with transcriptional uh, control of those genes. So suggesting that a vast majority of the genes can be uh, regulated by, uh, by this uh, active um, histone modification pathway. We can use uh, the fact that we collected histone modification and gene expression from the same cell to perform correlative analysis. Here, uh, the correlation was performed for different histone marks. For example, lysine 27 isolation is associated with uh, active uh, state of the chromatin, and we can perform correlation uh, regarding uh, genes next door, and we can identify those pairs where uh, such correlation is substantially higher than expected by chance. Uh, we can also look at lysine, 9, uh, lysine 27 trimethylation mark at the distal elements uh, and identify those pairs where the association is substantially negative than expected by chance. So based on this tool, uh, we can identify roughly 32,000 pairs of distal element and promoters where the acceleration of the histone modification, um, uh, lysine 27, is positively correlated with, uh, with gene expression. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, uh, similarly, 15,000 such pairs are showing uh, negative correlation between the repressive mark and the target genes. So this gave us the chance to um, uh, basically show that this distal element indeed is likely control the target genes of their, uh, uh, that are associated with them. Uh, so in the top half of this panel, this heat map showing a lysine 27 isolation on the distal element, we can see that uh, the predicted target genes is showing corresponding expression in the right cell types and the tissues. And similarly, uh, lysine 27 trimethylation marks is showing a negative correlation with the transcription of their predicted target genes. Um, so this is based on correlative evidence. We can also perform uh, in a single cell manner, a uh, high C or content context mapping to provide physical evidence that the predicted pairs of gene uh, and distal element are in spatial proximity. Uh, we invented single cell methyl high C for this purpose. Uh, single cell methyl high C uh, combines whole genome by sulfide sequencing with um, proximity ligation or whole genome 3C uh, to, uh, to basically achieve uh, two birds with one stone. Uh, in this uh, reaction, we first perform proximity ligation uh, and then uh, in individual uh, nuclei, we perform bisulfide conversion uh, and uh, afterwards we perform sequencing of the resulting DNA um, and we can basically learn um, we can then sort the cells uh, based on their unique DNA methylation patterns. DNA methylation is known to show cell type specific uh, patterns. So from this, we can basically see that um, uh, you can distinguish uh, endothelial cells, uh, the uh, CA1, CA2, CA3 type of neurons from uh, other cell types in the mouse hippocampus. Uh, and this basically shows the patterns of different, uh, uh, different marker genes, indicating that when you have low or high pole methylation, this, is, uh, this gene is actively transcribed, and that's how you can uh, annotate that cell cluster. 
And when you uh, pull all the cells together for each cluster, you can distinguish cell type specific loops as shown here for, uh, this is for inhibitor neurons compared to uh, CA1 active neurons. Uh, another method, uh, we call our method single cell methyl high C, a similar method invented by uh, Joe Ecker's lab uh, was, known, was called uh, single nuclei M3C sic, uh, where they apply this method for human prefrontal cortex, uh, identify uh, uh, both methylation and chromatin contact profiles for 4,000 uh, nuclei isolated from the uh, from this prefrontal cortex. And here you can, again, see the um, different clusters based on the CPG methylation profiles. And then you can determine uh, loops uh, in a cell type specific manner. Uh, my uh, collaborator, Ming Hu, recently invented a method called a uh, computational tool called snap high c that can call loops from, uh, from cell types uh, from as few as 100 cells. So here from uh, one of the rarest cell, L6, uh, consisting of just about 100 cells, you can identify nearly 10,000 loops. Um, uh, by contrast, if you use another method that apply to bulk high C called hiccups, uh, you, you, you have very low uh, uh, detection sensitivity. So, so this snap high C really allow us to map uh, quantum loops in a cell, highly cell type specific manner. So in the remaining time, I'd like to address the question about insulators. Uh, these are elements that um, provide the mechanism for enhanced promoter selectivity. The question is how do they work to modulate enhanced target selectivity? Um, the model goes this, um, the insulators potentially block enhanced promoter contacts. And uh, Steve mentioned that uh, we discovered this TAD boundaries a few years ago um, uh, based on a high C analysis. High C is a way to identify genome wide chromatin contacts. And we discovered uh, in 2012 that uh, genomic regions uh, are seg segmented into domains, we call TADs, uh, that are uh, basically each TADs consist of uh, interactions, uh, local quantity interactions that are very high within the domain, but relatively few between domains. And the TAD boundaries are, uh, are ones where we can, uh, we can associate with having such property that they uh, might separate the uh, domains, uh, adjacent domains. So uh, discovery of the TAD boundary uh, with such property of separating uh, quantum interactions between TADs uh, immediately suggest that they might uh, correspond to uh, insulators, and that may be the reason insulator works. Another evidence that support this is that TAD boundaries are associated with uh, very high concentration of uh, CDCF binding. So you can see even though, um, well, CDCF binding genome-wide is uh, everywhere, but TAD boundaries are particularly concentrated for CDCF binding sites, uh, especially clusters of CDCF binding. So this allowed us uh, to hypothesize at the time that TAD boundaries are really what insulators um, are doing. Um, and we have been trying to search for functional evidence and, um, and over the years, there is a uh, model proposed to, to say that um, uh, TADs are formed uh, by the action of cohesin complex in a way we call loop extrusion. So cohesin is a motor protein that can load anywhere than DNA and begin to um, extrude DNA in this direction through its ring-shaped uh, structures. Uh, it's a DNA ATPase dependent motor protein. Uh, but when cohesin encountered CTCF, uh, it will, uh, the complex is stalled temporarily, and that creates this uh, appearance of the loops uh, extruded through this ring structure and the formation of the TAD boundaries. So this, this theory has now received extensive support 
uh, genetic support, molecular support, biochemical support. Now, um, how does this relate to uh, insulators? Uh, to test this, we need a insulator reporter assay. Uh, so we uh, take advantage of the knowledge that SOX2 in mouse embryonic stem cells is driven by a distal enhancer located 110 kilobase away. Uh, we ask whether we insert an element in between the enhancer and the SOX2 expression. We can then control, uh, we can then test whether this is an uh, uh, insulator. So we constructed a uh, mouse embryonic stem cell strain where uh, one of the SOX2, uh, each of the SOX2 alleles is tagged with a uh, fluorescent gene, uh, and cherry and GIP uh, respectively. And then we perform uh, uh, basically um, a cassette exchange to basically insert any sequence in between the uh, SOX2 and the soup enhancer on the cast allele uh, but the other layer is remaining intact so, uh, to serve as a control. Another control we introduced is uh, inserting these elements outside of the super enhancer so that when you want, uh, so that we can test that if this insertion is orientation specific. Uh, so we first tested a uh, known insulator, HS5, and you can see that compared to no insertion, inserting this element in between the SOX2 and super enhancer brings uh, GIP expression relative to the other allele uh, by about uh, 10 to 15 percent chance. As a control, you basically see a very little change, suggesting indeed that this is an insulator. So we apply this uh, reporter assay to uh, roughly uh, 11 uh, CDCM binding sites uh, that are located in the tab boundaries. Uh, mainly two TAD boundaries, one in the SOX9 KCNH J2 locus, another is the PAX3 and F, uh, F4A TAD boundary locus, and there are multiple CDCF binding sites in these regions. And you can see using this uh, in this bar charts that um, in general single CDCF binding sites bring a modest uh, insulation uh, of SOX2 enhancer. Um, so this is significant this, in, in different orientations. Some uh, CT, CT cell binding sites uh, are acting as a strong, uh, as in, in significant insulators in one orientation, um, but not the other orientation. Um, so this is uh, orientation dependent as well, but they don't appear to have a, a consensus. What's interesting is when we begin to test combinations of CDCI binding sites, the insulation strengths increase as the number of CDCI binding sites increase. Uh, when we have four or more insulators, uh, the, uh, we achieve a maximum insulation compared to, uh, to the control vectors. So um, multiples of CDCI binding sites uh, appear to increase its insulation potential. What's interesting is the, uh, and also a surprise finding is that uh, when we tested the CTCI binding sites outside of tab boundaries, we found a no significant insulation. So this is achieved using a synthetic insulation uh, that, uh, construct where we concatenate uh, six or more uh, CTCI binding sites including its core and 60 base pair upstream and downstream together. We make six such copies in both orientations and insert it into uh, between SOX2 and the super enhancer. When we, we test the boundary CDCI binding sites, you can see very significant reduction of SOX2 expression. But when we tested uh, six copies of uh, non-boundary CDCI binding sites, uh, the, in, there's no significant reduction of SOX2. Even 15 copies of non-boundary CDC site does not lead to measurable uh, decrease of SOX2 expression. This is shocking because we uh, were not expecting that CDCF binding um, to show um, such uh, boundary or non-boundary specificity. Uh, 
so to further examine whether this is due to its uh, boundary uh, se adjacent sequences, uh, we perform chimeric uh, test uh, where we uh, mix and match the core motif or the adjacent sequences together, uh, or including scrambled sequence together. Um, uh, so with this approach, we can test, we can show that uh, the boundary CTCI binding sites, um, basically, uh, if you um, uh, mix the core motif of the boundary with the non-boundary adjacent sequences, it reduce its insulation substantially. So uh, this is a uh, 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 boundary CTCI binding site uh, with uh, bound, its core motif, but if you switch the non-boundary CDCI binding sites adjacent sequence with the core motif of the boundary, you reduce its um, insulation potential. Uh, vice versa, if you add the um, boundary adjacent sequences next to the uh, core motif of the non-boundary CDCF, now you reduce the, um, now you increase the insulation strength. So we uh, conclude that the adjacent CDCI binding adjacent sequences is important for its uh, insulation activity. So in the next couple of slides, uh, I will just go very quickly to show you that um, the mechanism of CDCF mediated insulation is very much related to uh, its ability to block enhancer promoter contact. We show this using two strategies. One is by looking at uh, proximity ligation, we can see that SOX2 and super enhancer is uh, in context if you have no insertion. If you have uh, two copies of insertion, this context is reduced by half. If you really have four copies of insertion, this context is reduced even further. But if you test uh, this in the downstream circumstances, the reduction is, much, uh, is not seen. We can show that this is because insertion of two or four CDCI binding sites created a new type boundaries uh, at right where it's inserted. Uh, this indicate that type boundary formation is indeed associated with insulator formation. And then finally, I think in one piece of most exciting result and of fruitful collaboration with Xiaomi Drones Lab, we apply their most recent Crompton tracing methodology uh, to this system. Uh, in this case, uh, published in uh, 2018, uh, you can perform a sequential round of uh, hybridization and imaging to trace the uh, locus of uh, SOX2. And then we basically plot the distance of, um, uh, basically pairwise distance within the SOX2 locus. We can see that in the wild type copy, 129 alleles, uh, you have a single tad forming here, and the SOX2 and super enhancer is showing uh, closer in spatial uh, distance. But inserting four copies of CDCI binding site create a second tad boundaries here and allowing uh, reducing the SOX2 uh, super enhancer contacts. Uh, and again, this is a single cell uh, format. You can basically plot the probability of TAD, of TAD boundary formation along this locus. And clearly inserting CDCI binding sites increase the probability of this insertion site to form uh, TAD boundaries. And this can be visualized uh, on certain individual uh, configurations. And finally, uh, as uh, I think, uh, really a, a holy grail in the field, we can see that insertion of the four CB, uh, CDCI binding sites reduced the probability of SOX2 enhancer promoter contacts uh, in, uh, in this population by measuring the spatial uh, distance. Um, so this shows that uh, the uh, probability of SOX2 SOX enhancer promoter forming uh, less than 150 base pair, uh, 150 nanometers distance is substantially reduced if you have four CDCI binding sites inserted. But if you have um, uh, no insertion or have a mutant CDCI binding site inserted, uh, the distance between the two alleles is equivalent. 
So to summarize, I've uh, described uh, several uh, strategies that my lab entails, uh, uh, employs to study the non-coding DNA uh, and gene regulation. First, we are using single cell um, approach to interrogate chromatin accessibility in different cells and uh, tissues uh, to study cell types of specific uh, regulatory elements. Uh, now we invented uh, pair uh, tag and pair seek uh, to assess correlated uh, distal element and the promoter target relationship. Uh, we also use uh, single cell methyl high C, uh, also known as single nucleus M3C sick to interrogate chromatin interactions in single cell fashion. And then finally, uh, we elucidated how insulators work uh, and in ways that are similar to, uh, that are changing quantum topology. Uh, to end, uh, I'm sorry I exceeded my time, but um, this is um, my lab uh, a few years ago, a picture taken before the COVID-19. Uh, this is the center that, uh, for epigenomics that I direct. And I mentioned people's name who contributed to different parts of the story. I'd like to specifically thank my collaborators for their support and uh, being um, very uh, collaborative over the years uh, and my uh, funding agencies uh, whose uh, support uh, is indispensable for, for this study. And uh, I have two disclaimers to make here and uh, I'd like to stop here and take questions. Thank you uh, very much for your um, attention. I think, ho I hope we still have time for questions. Definitely, thank you, Bing. Thank you, Bing. Sure. Great talk. Um, so I would suggest if people want to ask questions, just unmute yourself and uh, uh, directly ask questions, or you can type in the chat box and I'll read the questions if you prefer that way. Okay. Hi, uh, Bing, this is Haifan. Great talk. Hi, Haifan, thank you. Yeah, I have a question for you. I wonder if you insert multiple copies of a CTCF binding sites together with multiple copies of cohesin binding sites into a single locus outside the boundaries, will that be sufficient to cause silencing effect? Uh, that's, a, that's a good suggestion. So uh, cohesin doesn't have a binding, uh, sequence binding uh, specificity. In fact, cohesin mm. is thought to be recruited by CDCF to uh, DNA um, due to its protein-protein interactions with mm. a uh, N terminus of a CDCF uh, region that was uh, shown earlier uh, this year. So, uh, but cohesin. So is there any way to then get these two proteins together? Yes, yeah. uh, I think by doing DCAS9 recruitment, we uh, we potentially could do that uh, directly uh, uh, tether cohesin to the. Uh, to any sequence. Uh, so we, that, that would be one way to, to do it. Uh, what we do show is, if, in fact, if you, um, so cohesin, if you modulate the cohesin uh, being a loading probability, um, for example, by getting rid of um, uh, WAPO, which is the cohesin unloader, we actually can see an enhanced insulation of this uh, reporter system. Again, supporting the evidence, uh, supporting the idea that if you uh, make cohesin stay longer uh, on the DNA, uh, it will make the insulation even stronger. Uh, inversely, if we get rid of the cohesin loader protein, the BL, uh, we actually can see very uh, mild insulation, even for the strong insulators that we demonstrate here. Uh, so due to time, I don't have, uh, uh, I don't have slides to show them, but uh, I'm glad you asked that. Great, I have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, sure. Professor Jun Lu asks, are, the, are there common sequence motifs in the adjacent sequences of TAD boundary CTCF sites? Yes, uh, we just recently uh, discovered that there is a consensus uh, located roughly 12 base pair upstream of the core CTCF motif and uh, we're now testing the requirement for that sequence motif for the uh, CDCF uh, mediated insulation. 
Great. Uh, and, and I guess um, uh, you must have done this. I, I also had this question. Like when I initially saw that uh, you say that the boundary CDCF and the non-boundary CDCF sites seem to behave differently, uh, my immediate thought is like, oh, maybe the consensus sequence of the CDCF site itself is actually different. But it sounds like that's not the case. The, the, that's right. The consensus is exactly the same. We did this wow. uh, domain uh, well, sw swapping experiment and we show that the adjacent sequence, in fact, is uh, necessary for uh, insulation activity. Uh, so CDCF binding alone is not sufficient for mm. bringing insulator. And this is, a long, uh, I think it's a long puzzle in the field for, uh, for decades. Uh, CDCF binding sites uh, were mapped uh, in 2007 by my group and also by KG Zhao's lab, genome-wide. And uh, the surprise was it was everywhere. It was uh, not only at um, between genes, but also at promoters uh, and many sequences. So it was, uh, un at the time, inconceivable that uh, a CDZ binding site would function as insulators if it's located at actively transcribed the gene promoters. Uh, now it appears that uh, the adjacent sequence appear to uh, maybe other factors are playing a role in mediating CTCF's insulation activity that we, uh, we did not know before. So I think one of the uh, exciting new angles from this study is identifying the differences between boundary CDCF and the non-boundary CDCF that correlate with the formation of TADs and the insulation activity. Great. And uh, another question from Zach, I think Zach Smith, is do you think that the effect on gene expression may be different if the insulator was established prior to the enhancer being activated? Or does the sequence of events matter? Uh, that is a good question. Um, I tend to believe that formation of an insulator uh, is regardless of enhancer is active or not. And this is mainly based on our observation that TADs are uh, more or less cell type invariant uh, during development and uh, in adults. Uh, so, um, so the TADs uh, is formed very early on, but many, many enhancers are active only later in life. So I, I tend to believe that uh, the formation of uh, TADs and the, therefore insulator uh, is there uh, uh, way before uh, enhancers are turned on. Great. Uh, I would uh, propose last question because uh, Bing's next appointment is actually in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no worry. Sorry, my fault for being uh, uh, problem. speaking too long. I, I have a quick question about the, um, the paired tag method, which is really exciting. Thank you. And uh, so I was wondering, um, so the the ATAC, well, actually both with the paired um, paired seek and the paired tag, ATAC seek and chip seek data, does that have enough dynamic range to sort of match the RNA seek data to get those correlations that you're looking at um, to to match the enhancers and promoters? Um, let me bring that slides up. Uh, this is the slides that you're talking about. Um, so. Uh, yeah, there is a very strong correlation uh, between uh, distal elements and uh, the target gene. Let me show the, uh, the real slides. So the, I, I guess if I, uh, your question is, is there a uh, sufficient dynamic range for us to uh, pinpoint significant uh, correlation, right? Uh, and that's shown in the slides. Uh, indeed, uh, we can detect uh, quite a number of pairs that show a significant correlation better than expected by chance. Um, so I, I, apologize. I think this heat map is, uh, uh, <laughs> isn't, doesn't convey the quantitative aspect of this correlation um, better than this, uh, this chart. Is, is that what you're asking? So yeah, I guess, um, so I guess the other half of the question is, is mechanistically, so if you're at the single cell level, I think when you have bulk data and you see a correlation with say ATAC-seq or CHIP-seq, then often it's because more cells have that mark and then so it correlates with expression. But at the single cell level, that can't be the explanation. So what do you oh, yeah. think? Yes, so for this analysis, we perform on um, cell cluster level. 
uh, and I think the can the same algorithm can be applied to uh, a single cell population. Um, y yes, uh, I think the now I understand better your question. If you do this on an individual cell level, yes, it's going to be hard because now you have one or off, uh, what one non or one or non event. Um, so the, you still have to rely upon having hundreds or thousands of cells to give you the statistic power. You can use logistic regression uh, or other means to identify such correlations, uh, even at the single cell level. Okay, thanks. Sure. Great, thank you, Bing. I'd like to propose a My round pleasure. of applause to Dr. Bing Renan for the great talk. And thank you. Uh, we will continue with the individual meetings today. Thank you. Great to meet you, thank you very much. And uh, I hope to remain in contact. Great. All right. See you later. Bye.